doing. I'm doing. But the live stream just started. Good afternoon, everybody, or good evening. So there are um, a number of us, obviously, who are here this evening, and there are a number of us that were not able to make it. So um, I just spoke to somebody on the phone on the East Coast, so we are live streaming this evening's program. Uh, and so therefore, um, if we want to get a copy of Rabbi Cohen's lecture, we'll be able to do that. Uh, before I introduce uh, Jenny, Dolly and Steve's daughter. Uh, I just wanted to share a few words for those of us that um, know Steve and knew Steve and will always know Steve Drazen. Uh, he had a big impact on this community. Uh, he was part of Or Tzion before that Or Hadash before my tenure here. Um, he used to tell the story when he would come down from, from Desert Mountain and uh, they'd be, uh, that was when Or Hadash started when Rabbi Damsky was with the community and who he became very close with, um, and sometimes would make the 10th in the Minyan. That was before um, Or Hadash at the time didn't have regular Shabbat services, but met every other week, and there was a program called Shabbat at Home, and all of these kinds of things. Um, and if you fast forward a few years later, I, I got to know Steve quite well, along with Dolly, uh, both personally and, and from the synagogue. We, we spent ample time together. Um, when I first came, they hosted an evening for my installation. We talked about Rabbi Harold Kushner, and he came and installed me as the rabbi here. So we've had an ongoing friendship. Um, Steve used to sit in the front row. That was something that was important to him. Although he was very modest about that, he came with his talid, he came with his sidur, um, and went about his business, uh, and never having ego or anything like that, but wanted to always connect and stay involved. And so Steve was very involved in our congregation, on our finance committee. He then became the co-chair of our Lador Vador Society with people like Trisha Baran and, and others that really, and Hannah Lang, that really set the tone for creating an endowment future for the congregation. Um, I remember fondly um, when Steve, I don't know, Dolly, if you remember this, and Jenny, if you remember this, but there was a um, Shabbat Hagadol, the Sabbath before Passover, that Steve recited, he re-recited the Haftorah. And he had practiced really, really hard for it. And it was celebrating his Bar Mitzvah anniversary. 
And um, it was, do you remember that? And it was really, really special. It was in the other building. Um, but it was a moment where he spoke about his Judaism and his love for Judaism. Um, as time went on, Steve began to talk to me about a gentleman named Rabbi Daniel Cohen. Uh, and I had heard of, of Daniel on numerous occasions from the Drazens uh, in Stamford, Connecticut, um, but never really had the opportunity to meet Rabbi Cohen until he had come, and even then on the periphery, speaking a couple of times in the Phoenix community through um, the Life and Legacy Foundation, the Jewish Federation, he had come a couple of times to speak. Um, I really got to know Daniel uh, when all of us, Steve's family, um, graciously enabled me and allowed me and asked for me to come after I, I, I pleaded with them to go to do Steve's funeral in Stanford uh, just a year ago or so in January. Uh, and when I got there to the synagogue there, the conservative congregation that held the funeral for hundreds of people, I had the opportunity to meet Rabbi Cohen. Um, and we both shared words together and, and were on the bima together to um, acknowledge and eulogize Steve. And before the funeral started, I said to Rabbi Cohen, I want to already get something on the books. Do you remember this conversation? I said, I want to already get something on the books. I want you to come and speak during, on the first yard site of Steve Drazen and come and speak in his shul and in our shul. And we looked at the calendar, we put it in our phones, and here we are right now at this very moment. So I wanna thank you, Rabbi Cohen, for being here. Um, I'm going to uh, leave us with just a thought, um, and that is the following. I mentioned this yesterday. Um, you know, the, there's a statement in Pirkei Avot, uh, The Ethics of Our Sages, that says, um, Keter Shem Tov, Right, that the crown of a good name, Netkeneged Kulam, surpasses all of the other crowns of Judaism. Uh, and for those of us that knew Steve, he had such a good name. He was such an important person to his family, um, to our family here at Ortzion, uh, and to the Jewish people in the entire world. And we're grateful to Dolly and to your family um, for sharing Steve with us during the time that we had. Um, we are very grateful. We don't take that for granted. And um, we know that you're in your own transitions in life right now. And uh, know that you always have a place here with us, and uh, as does your family. I'm going to invite Jenny Fuchs to come forward, Dolly and Steve's daughter, to introduce Rabbi Cohen tonight. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. I know my father is looking down with his great big smile, grinning ear to ear, confelling that you have all come to honor his memory and to hear the wise words of a man who helped my father understand the value of his life and the legacy that he would be leaving. While he may have left our earth too soon, I'm so grateful that fate led him to Rabbi Cohn in the last couple of years so that he could realize the most important lessons of his life. For those of you who may not be aware of how my dad met Rabbi Cohn, I'm honored to take that credit. About three years ago, dad was asked by a close friend to be a part of an interreligious discussion group in Stanford, Connecticut. This group was made up of about five men of diverse religious backgrounds. When it was dad's turn to organize the group's discussion last summer, he turned to a book that I had recommended to him entitled, What Will They Say About You When You're Gone? Creating a Life of Legacy, written by D Rabbi Cohn. At that time, he had no idea the impact this book would have on his life and his recent death and the legacy that he left for my mom, my brother, and I, his five grandchildren, and all the people he touched because of this book and the way that he led his life. Amazingly, upon his death on January 7th last year, this book was sitting on dad's desk, dog-eared, written in and highlighted, and it gave us a final gift since we were able to read with our own eyes exactly how dad would like to have been remembered and the legacy that he hoped to leave for us. In addition, because of the impact that his book had on his life, dad had gifted it to several close friends, many of whom are, are here this afternoon. And we in turn continued this mitzvah by handing it out at his funeral. For dad, legacy meant giving, his time, his energy, financially to his family, his friends, his community, and his synagogue. In honor of his blessed memory, it is my honor to introduce my teacher and friend, Rabbi Cohn. 
I first want to thank him for making it here today. As dad would have it, since he always loved a great snowstorm and tracking logistics, Rabbi's Cone, Rabbi Cone's trip here was not without some drama due to the big storm that hit the East Coast this weekend, but thankfully he made it. Rabbi Cohn has served in the rabbinate for over 20 years and currently serves as senior rabbi at Congregation of Gudith Shalom in Stamford, Connecticut, the largest modern Orthodox synagogue in New England. He's the author of What Will They Say About You When You Are Gone, Creating a Life of Legacy. In addition, he is co-host with Reverend Greg Zoll of the nationally syndicated radio show, The Rabbi and the Reverend, and writes for the Huffington Post log and is a Bottom Line Inc. expert. He enjoys doing magic shows, playing sports, writing, searching for God, and living life with joy and an ever-present smile, which he always does have on his face, even right now. Rabbi Cohn and his wife, Diane, are the grateful parents of six daughters. And here he is. Thank you very much for that warm uh, welcome. Just a postscript. My oldest daughter got married about a year and a half ago, thank God, and we had our first uh, grandson five months ago. A boy! <clears throat> it's really, uh, truly an honor to be here uh, this afternoon, paying tribute to Steve, Rabbi Kaplan. I want to uh, thank you so much for your warm words. When we met each other, I felt we're kindred spirits, and not only through uh, Steve, but also our joint mission to really try to spread more light in the world. So I appreciate uh, your uh, generosity, your hospitality, and it kind of is ironic that the uh, speaking engagement that I had planned for the furthest away was the one I had the most trouble getting to. But thank God I made it. And I want to thank uh, Dolly and the family for your friendship. Um, it really means so much. I don't feel that my presence here in any way is an accident. Um, I'm here to speak from the heart. Steve was a person who certainly really gave of himself to everybody that he met. And I think that's why his legacy is so strong, because he understood that he wasn't here just for his own glory, but rather really to help try to make the world a better place. And uh, Jenny, I know that your father is always smiling when we study together. I feel his presence and um, want to wish you comfort. And uh, I got a real good tour today of uh, Phoenix. I went with uh, Adam and with uh, Steve's brother, uh, Don. We went to the uh, car show, which I'll get back to. I think that was the fastest tour of a car show that I ever had. <laughs> uh, but I thank you and also your generosity, of course, in trying to spread Steve's light. So God willing, uh, through the words that we share this evening, his memory should serve as a source of blessing. And God willing, we'll share many happy occasions together with your family in the future. I want to begin, actually, by speaking about a heroine of mine that I think in many ways really encapsulates the theme for this evening and in many ways what Steve represented, and that's the notion of becoming a blessing. We oftentimes say about a person, Yehei Zichro Baruch, that his memory should be for a blessing. What does it mean to be a blessing? And I want to go back in time to 1973 in Madison Square Garden on November 8th. Was anybody there? The Rangers were not playing. And nor were the Knicks. And it was not a night of sport, but it was a night of spirit. It wasn't a night of selling merchandise, but it was a night of mitzvot. And I want to take you back to a moment in time. It was a woman who was there. And she brought together thousands of Jews on that night. Her name was Rebetzin Esther Youngrace. And she was a survivor of the Shoah, of the Holocaust. And she had a dream. Her dream was to remind her generation about what it meant to be a Jew. And as the scene began, the lights were out in Madison Square Garden. And all of a sudden, there was a voice that said the following words. You are a Jew. You have created civilizations. You have given birth to every idea that shaped mankind. Justice, peace, love, the dignity of man have all had their genesis in your Torah. But above all, you have given the unique mission of proclaiming the wonders of God. 
you are a Jew. And she opened up by reminding people of why they were here in this world. And she was invoking a message that was given thousands of years ago to Abraham. God speaks to Abraham many years ago and he says, Lech lecha, go to the land of Canaan. Leave your homeland. And he says, I want you to go to this land, the land of Israel, the Heye Bracha, and you will be a blessing. And Abraham was on a mission given by God to be a source of blessing in the world. And what does it mean to be that bracha, to be that blessing? How many of you here believe in the notion of becoming and being a blessing in the world? What does it mean? Do you want to make the world a better place? And what does that mean, that unique mission, to be a blessing? So if you go back in time, in many ways, this to a certain degree is what Rebbitz and Esther Youngrice was sharing. She said, I don't want you to identify as a Jew because, God forbid, you're in a sense of pressure. You have to make a tough choice about what it means to be a Jew, but I want you to come to that from a sense of strength, from a sense of blessing to realize what your mission is in this world. And the question is, what does it mean to be that source of blessing? to bring that bracha, to bring that blessing in the world. Because when I think about Steve's legacy, Steve was a person, when you think about what it means to be a blessing, who as an individual understood that it wasn't about doing things for himself, but every step along the way, he wanted to help bring blessing to the world. And the question is, how do we do that? How do we create that source of blessing in our life? And I want to share some ideas with you this evening about what it means to be that source of blessing. And it relates first and foremost to having a sense of mission of what our purpose is in the world. There's a sense, of course, for each and every one of us about what our role is in this world. I had the opportunity today, as I mentioned before, to go to a car show. And it reminded me a little bit of a message that I saw many years ago when I was in California. I was opposite Century City in California, and there I was looking out my hotel window, and outside the hotel window I saw all this paparazzi because there was a car that was pulling up and I thought there was a celebrity that was getting out of the car. And I was wondering, who is this person who's getting out of the car that everybody was focused on? Well, lo and behold, the person gets out of the car. And then I see after the person has left, they're still taking pictures of the car. And I realized that in that world, people were defining people not for what they do and not for what they are, but for what they have. They were confusing people with their roles and not their souls and who they really are. And as I said to Adam, he set me up for this because when I was walking around seeing cars today that were hundreds of thousands of dollars, He said, Rabbi, I'm taking you to the dark side. (laughs) And now let's bring some ortzion, some light. Because we live in a world that sometimes it's very hard to appreciate what that source of blessing is all about. Who we really are. We're not defined by the jobs that we have. But we're defined by a sense of mission. We're defined by a sense of God endowing within each and every one of us a holy spark that's saying to me, to you, regardless of our level of observance, that I believe in you. When you wake up in the morning, what is the first thing you're supposed to say in the morning? Well, Shema is pretty good. We can give you a cookie for that one. (laughs) Shema is not the first thing you say in the morning. What do you say? Very good, you say, Modeh ani lefanecha. And I was talking to my friend, you say, thank God, when I was in Colorado, I would say, thank God I'm a country boy. (laughs) Say, thank God I'm alive. To realize that I'm not just taking life for granted, but every day I am recognizing that. I'm recognizing today as a gift. I'm here with a purpose. No day is an accident. No day should just run in from one to the next. And then what's fascinating is people forget the rest of Moda'ani. You say at the very beginning of Moda'ani, thank God I'm alive. And then you say in Hebrew, Rabba emunatecha. 
which means great is your faith in me. It's not enough just to say, God, I believe in you, but to know every morning that, God, you believe in me, that I can be that source of blessing in the world, that I have a unique mission in the world. And the truth is it's that realization that ultimately creates a sense of meaning and a sense of purpose that goes beyond any job that we have. Tonight's topic was becoming a blessing, discovering your renewable energy. If you define yourself simply by what your job is, by what you do, then you finish that job and say, what do I do next? But if you define yourself by a sense of holy purpose, that my job here in this world is to create blessing in the world, then no matter what my job is, I'm just having a new opportunity to fulfill that job, but just in a different vein. And that's ultimately what our mission is. To become a blessing is not only what Esther Youngrai said. It's not only what Abraham was told. But it's actually what Moses is told and he tells the Jewish people at the very end of his life. Moses says at the very end of his life, he literally has days to go. And he makes a very odd statement to the Jewish people. He says, see, I have given you today the choice between life and death. Blessing and curse. And then he says, I'll say it in Hebrew because it sounds better, uvacharta b'chayim, choose life. And when he's saying choose life, why wouldn't I choose life? Why do I need a commandment to choose life? What was Moses saying? Moses was saying that sometimes you can get so paralyzed by the world around you, so stuck sometimes is what is happening in the world, You forget that every day you have to make a choice to turn a fleeting moment into something which is eternal. To make that difference, to create that blessing. And that's what Moses was telling us and what Abraham was telling us. And when we appreciate that notion of blessing, then we stay inspired with every day, and then we never lose faith. And how do we stay inspired? There's a phrase... By the way, how's the attendance on Yom Kippur, Rabbi? Just checking. After Yisker, we won't talk about. We have that same problem, too, even in Orthodox synagogues. But I want to tell you something. And this relates to what it means to be a blessing. At the very end of Yom Kippur, we make the following statement. We say, God, I am sorry for stealing from you. God, I'm sorry for stealing from you. That's the one thing we say at the very end of Yom Kippur. Now, if you look, you'll see it in many of the liturgies. The question is, what are we saying at the very end of Yom Kippur? I've hopefully talked about all the things I've done wrong. And then the last thing that we say before we're about to go eat is, God, I'm sorry for stealing. So the rabbis explain this is not referring to the notion of stealing like theft. This is referring to the sense of, God, I maybe have used some of the gifts that you've given me. And unfortunately, I haven't used them to help you. I haven't used them to help the world. I've only used them for myself. A friend of mine, and this is a sad story, but also I find very inspiring. It was a young woman who unfortunately had a brain tumor. And the only way that she was able to live is they had to take out a part of her brain in order for her to live. And they said to her, they said, it seems the only thing that we can take away that will enable you to live is the ability for you to speak. You won't be able to speak again, but you'll be able to live. And the first words out of the girl's mouth were, but then how am I going to pray? But then how am I going to pray? She didn't ask, well, then how am I going to talk to my friends? How am I going to pray? She understood that whatever she had ultimately was for the blessings that God gave her. And when we talk about this notion of blessing, it means really thinking about deeply. The resources that I have, the time, everything that I have, how am I using that ultimately to serve God? And that's part of the realization of being a blessing. And then the question becomes... How do we develop that renewable energy? We develop that renewable energy 
And I shared this with Jenny. I won't put you on the spot. Jenny, come up here for a minute. Come on, Jenny. This is in memory of your dad. We need a little action here. This is okay. I will not quiz you too much. Okay. I think you'll remember this part, though. We actually practiced beforehand. So we were talking together. And here's the easy, I'll give you a softball, okay? Who was the one that was afraid to take God's mission in the world? Moses. Moses. Good. <laughs> that was, give her a big round of applause. That was good. <laughs> I know, I know. I could have given you a little bit more. But it's interesting. Because Moses is a person that knows his role in this world is to be a blessing. That's, he knows, Abraham's mission. The problem is, anyone know, God appears to Moses, and he says to Moses, he says, I want you to be the one to go speak to Pharaoh and to save the Jewish people. Does Moses take the job right away? What does he do? He complains to God, and he says, God, I can't speak, I can't do this, I can't do this, right? And God actually gets very upset at him, and God says to him, he says, who do you think gave you the power to speak? Who do you think gave you the power to hear, to see? It is I. And if I gave you this power, I know you can do it. I know you can do it. And God says to him key words. He says to him, I will be with you. And Rashi says there's something interesting. What was God telling Moses? He said to Moses, Shali, I'll translate in a minute. Velo shelcha, this mission that I sent you on is not about you. It's about me. If you think I'm sending this out, you out, so you can be famous, it's all about you, Moses, you're not going to make it. But if you know that I am your ambassador, that you're working for me, that you have a mission in this world, anything is possible. And Jenny, you said to me at that time, I remember sitting in the class, He said, my father would tell me that. He said, I'm not asking you to do something that I don't believe that you can do. And that was the kind of chizuk, as we say, that he gave. I think to a lot of us, somebody actually said to me, here, I got a book from Steve. I thought I was one of the few who got a book from Steve. (laughs) He believed in a lot of people. And he helped give them that strength. And I believe he got that because he believed that God believed in him. And when you believe that, anything is possible. And there's not a single individual in this room that God doesn't believe in. Because if God didn't believe in you, you wouldn't be sitting here today. And I can tell you, God didn't allow us to wake up this morning just simply to have fun. God woke us up this morning for a higher purpose and to be his partners, to be his ambassadors. And everything that we do, God is by our side. I was sharing this also. What do we read? I know it was a very long Haftorah. I heard it was long yesterday. Is that accurate, Rabbi? (laughs) By the way, every rabbi wants to make sure the person who reads the Haftorah this week is fast. (laughs) We had a problem about a year ago. We had a guy who didn't realize it was a yurtzeit, really slow. Yesterday was kind of quick. But we read about the splitting of the Red Sea. And it's interesting. This relates to what it means to have faith to move forward with that sense of blessing. The scene is Moses is going to the Red Sea. He has the Egyptians behind him, and he has the sea in front of him. And what does he do? He cries out to God and says, what? We're stuck. I got the Egyptians behind me. And I got the sea in front of me. And he cries out to God. And God says to him, stop praying to me. What does God tell Moses? He says, take the staff. But what does he say? He says, I want you to walk into the water. And until you walk into the water and show that you have faith, not only in words, but in action, I'm not going to split the sea. The story about a fellow was a tightrope walker and he was walking across a tightrope and he said to the people there, do you believe that I can walk across this tightrope? And everyone said, we believe. 
Then he said, do you believe I can walk across this tightrope with the wheelbarrow? And he said, we believe. Do you believe I can walk across blindfolded backwards in this wheelbarrow across the canyon? And they said, we believe. And then he said, who's jumping in the wheelbarrow? <laughs> well, that was fast. Nobody walked in. The truth is you can say you believe, but God also demands of us and asks of us sometimes to walk into the water to move forward, even when we don't know what the result is, because he knows that we have to demonstrate that sense of faith and action to walk forward. To become a blessing means that we're here for a higher purpose. It means we can draw on God for renewable energy, because God is our partner. And it means also we have to have that sense of faith sometimes to move forward one step at a time. But I think it means something else as well. Becoming a blessing means that we can have eternal impact in every single thing that we do. We cannot underestimate the power of a single action that we do that can reverberate for eternity. And I'm eternally grateful. You know, I was thinking, I was looking through some old emails that Steve had sent me. Just the little things in terms of, first of all, the introduction that you gave to the book. And I remember Steve wanted to create impact. You know, he sent me an email saying, Rabbi, I want to meet with you. I remember this. I didn't answer him for a couple days. And then he says, Rabbi, I want to meet with you. And we got together. I still remember it was good kosher sushi in Stanford. And uh, he told me how, like, seriously, he wanted really to learn this book and really to think about his life. And then we went to his group that he had. And he really felt in many ways that if there was a little bit of a ripple effect or a light that he could create, that was something that he wanted to do. And ultimately, that's the way we create eternity. I've been to Phoenix before, but I want to share an idea and another story that relates to this, which you haven't heard in Phoenix. But to me, it speaks a little about what this means to be a source of blessing at any place and any time. And it's the Elijah moment that I've spoken about before. How many of you are familiar with the Elijah moment? Wow. i got to come to Phoenix more, let me tell you. So the Elijah moment is really something rooted, I speak about it in the book, which is this notion that no matter what little act you can do, you may not be able to change the world, but if you change the world of one person, you can make all the difference. And it's based upon the story about Eliyahu, Hanavi, Elijah the prophet. How many of you have seen Elijah the prophet before? Did he come to your Seder? Well, he was in my Seder too. Oh my gosh. So... A man went to his mystic, and he said, I want to see Elijah the prophet. And Elijah, he was told, he said, if you go into the forest, bring some food for the Sabbath. There's a widow there, and if you spend Shabbat there with the widow, you'll see Eliyahu Hanavi. He goes there Friday night, no Elijah. Saturday, no Elijah. Finally, Sunday morning, he still doesn't see Elijah the prophet. The mystic says to him, he says, go back the next weekend, bring the food, to the widow, and now you'll see Elijah the prophet. He goes deep into the forest. He's within earshot of the woman's home. And he hears a young child crying out to the mother, saying, Mommy, where are we going to get food from for this Sabbath? And the mother turns to the child and says, Just like Elijah the prophet came last week, Elijah the prophet is going to come again. And it was in that moment that he realized that he was the Elijah the prophet that this person was waiting for. To be the Elijah means that any encounter is not just something to go by, but there's a possibility of potentially changing a person's life. Mark Twain said many years ago, the two most important days of your life are the day when you're born and the day when you understand why. And if we think about what that means, we can create so many blessings in our lives. And something happened in my synagogue a few months ago that I think is a wonderful example of what this means. Do you guys have a, um, I see you have an officer. Do you guys have a police officer in front of the synagogue here? When, just on Shabbat? Yeah. So we started to, unfortunately. And I make it my business, whenever I come in on Saturday morning, I always try to ask the name of the officer. And sometimes I'll quiz the congregation. Because I see he's a real person. I said, does anyone know the name? I want to make sure I know the name of the person. So I came in on the first day of Sukkot, and I said, what's your name? He said, my name is Brett Gardner. And by the way, he's not the outfielder for the New York Yankees. He's a Stanford police officer. And I said to him, thanks for being here today. 
he said to me, it's a holiday today? I said, yeah, it's a holiday. He said, I'm Jewish. He said, I didn't know it was a holiday. I said, yeah, today's a holiday about the Sukkot, the booths, it's a holiday of faith. And then he volunteers to me. He says, I didn't, he- I didn't even have a bar mitzvah. And I said to him, well, today's your lucky day. You're talking to the rabbi of the synagogue. <laughs> so I said to him, look, Steve, uh, Brett, I said, after the holiday, I will reach out to you at the Stanford Police Department, and I will teach you how to read Hebrew, and we'll invite you into the synagogue for a bar mitzvah. And he says to me, Rabbi, my mother will never believe it. I said, tell your mother you're going to have a bar mitzvah. And then he looks at himself, and he says, yeah, but I got all these tattoos on me. I can't have a bar mitzvah. I said, it's not what's on you, but it's what's in you, and God willing, you have a bar mitzvah. So that was the end of that on the first day of Sukkot. I'm thinking about this on the holiday of Sukkot, and then I come at the synagogue in Stanford on the last days of the holiday, Simchat Torah, when we celebrate the completion of the Torah. Lo and behold, who is the police officer right outside? It's Brett Gardner. And I say, Brett, today is your lucky day. I said, today you're going to have a bar mitzvah. He says, just don't embarrass me, Rabbi. I said, okay. So I go upstairs, it's 9 o'clock, and I'm thinking, oh, okay, I'll go back down during the Torah reading and get him. 11 a.m. in Stanford, Simchat Torah, a member of our synagogue named Judd Love faints. You can't make this up. EMS comes running into the synagogue. Who else comes running in? Brett Gardner, the police officer. Now, Brett Gardner turns out that Judd Love is fine, and literally we're finishing the Torah reading. And I say to Brett, I say, this is your moment. I said, you're going to have your bar mitzvah. By the way, Judd was fine. So Brett says, okay. So I bring him to the back of the synagogue. We have all these Torah tables. And there's a young boy that says, Brett, we're going to give you my yarmulke. And he takes off his yarmulke. And another gentleman that's visiting says, Brett, we're going to give you a prayer shawl. And he gives him the prayer shawl. And then I say, Brett, what's your Hebrew name? And then he says to me, I don't have a Hebrew name. I said, well, Brett, we're going to give you a Hebrew name right now. Can anyone guess what Hebrew name do I give Brett Gardner? Baruch. Very good. That's how I went to rabbinical school. Brett, Baruch, it's pretty close. I say, today your name is Baruch, and we're going to call you to the Torah. So we call him up, and the Torah is there, and then somebody gets a transliteration because he still doesn't know how to read Hebrew in the past eight days. And I explain to him what this is all about, and I say, we're celebrating your bar mitzvah. So after he reads from the Torah... I said, we just celebrated Brett's bar mitzvah. There's men and there's women there. We all start dancing in a circle together. And then I pull Brett in the middle and I start dancing with him. And we spoke afterwards. He said he told his mother. And it was one of the most meaningful moments of his life. I share this with you because it relates to something that I've spoken about before. But to me, what does it mean to be a blessing? It says at the very end of our lives, God is going to show us two films. One film is how we led our lives. And the other film is how we could have led our lives. And the difference between the two will determine how much ultimately of a blessing that we were. And I can only imagine, I think about this, 1130 in Stanford, God's going to show us two films. Gives me the chills. One film is of Brett Gardner, the Stanford police officer with his gun sitting outside the synagogue. And the other frame is of Brett Gardner dancing at his bar mitzvah. The only difference between those two is a simple hello, a simple reach out, and now you've changed things for eternity. And to me, ultimately, that's what it means to be a blessing. And I think about that. Because I think about that's the kind of way that Steve led his life. And God orchestrates things in the most amazing ways. You know, if we are truly God's partners, if we work for God, anything is possible. If you put out a little bit of light and you're out there, you never know where that light is going to go. I was in Houston last week speaking and it just touched me. Oftentimes, as those have heard me speak, I'll call somebody up for a blessing, uh, to, to give them a blessing that you give your children. And there was a man that came. He was the former chair of the Houston Community Foundation. He was an 83-year-old man. And I connected with him a little bit because I had seen him once before. And I brought him up to uh, give a blessing. And after I gave him the blessing, 
he was very moved by it. And he said to me these words. He says, thank you, Daddy. And I gave him a hug. I had no idea what he was talking about. But he said, thank you, Daddy. I gave him a hug. I only learned afterwards that he had lost his wife about five months ago. And he himself was battling with his own health issues. Then he came over to me and said, Rabbi, that meant a lot to me. He said, the last time I received such a blessing was from my father at my bar mitzvah 70 years ago. And he's saying to me, thank you, Daddy. And I have no idea what's going on in his head about how this moment created an impact for him. And ultimately, that's what life is all about. I just spoke about a week ago about my mother, and I want to share this with you. My mom passed away 30 years ago. She had a brain aneurysm when she was 44, and we just commemorated her 30th anniversary. And I shared that I feel that my mother's presence is with me all the time. And part of that is because she was a person who also created blessings all the time. I spoke about her hospitality, and it was amazing. I was once talking about we had a generous home. People would always come to our home if they needed a place. My uh, aunt is here, and she knows my brother. He would just bring people home from synagogue all the time. And my mom was a good spirit about it. And a number of years ago, I was speaking, and a woman raises her hand from the back. This is in Westchester. She said, oh, by the way, your mother hosted me, and she was, like, really helpful to me about 40 years ago. She was a student in New York. She came off a bad breakup, and she decided to go to Emory Law School. And she said, I was really in a deep funk. I just lost my boyfriend. And your mother took me in. I shared the story in synagogue, and the fellow who sponsored the Kiddush, his name was Scott Berger. He comes to me at Kiddush and says, oh, by the way, my brother, Michael Berger, always talks about how your parents gave them hospitality when he was visiting from Israel. Steve and we all can plant so many seeds. And the more that we do that, the more the blessings are eternal. And I believe because of the life that he led, and I take Rabbi Kaplan's words, you know, he said, you may be leaving physically this area, but the presence of Steve and what you've given to this community are going to be eternal. Because he believed, as I think we all do, that every day there's something unique to contribute. And I just want to conclude, you know, tonight is a holy night. I don't think we plan this this way. Tonight is actually Tu B'Shvat. Tu B'Shvat is a celebration of the planting, not only of the trees, but celebrating of potential of things that we put out there and we may not reap the benefits of until years later. It says, a very odd midrash, it says that when the Messiah comes, it says if you're, you're supposed to, let's say the Messiah came, so you go to greet the Messiah, that's pretty big news. There's one exception. It says if you're in the middle of planting a tree, finish planting the tree, and then go greet the Messiah. What are you doing? You're planting a tree. Go greet the Messiah. The answer is no. Symbolically, it's saying be a blessing, continue to plant those seeds, and ultimately that's a blessing that will endure forever. My hope and prayer is, is that we inculcate within us that spirit. You know, Stephen's Hebrew name is Shmuel ben Avraham. And Shmuel name means I hear a voice. And by the way, I don't believe he was hearing voices. Not in that way. But he was hearing a voice that he understood that God was calling him to try to be the best that he could be with the light that God gave him every day and then to take that light and share it with the world. And he could say, Hineni God, I am here, not for my own glory, but for you God and really to help try to spread the light. And certainly he did here. I know he does through his family. And God willing, in that way, his light will continue to shine. And I want to conclude with the words the Rebbets and Esther Younger I said in 1973 at the conclusion of her talk. Because when I was reading this, I thought also about Steve. She said, Within every Jew there lies a spark, a flicker of light, a teeny flame. And if you wish it, that teeny flame can become a great fire, from which the words he nanny, here I am, my God, shall emerge. My children come home. And that's what he embodied. And God willing, all of us will continue to spread that light. One candle lights many flames. We certainly can say, Yehei zichorno livracha, his memory is a source of blessing. And God willing, for all of us, will remember, and I say this to everyone, we are not our roles, we are our souls. We're here not just to accumulate, but we're here to do. 
And God willing, if we appreciate that, his blessing and ours will continue to reverberate me door la door for many, many generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Cohen. Um, I just want to thank you for being here. Um, we are grateful in your enthusiasm and your godliness and your soul um, have given us much to think about. And we are grateful and uh, thrilled that Steve aligned the weather appropriately for you to be here uh, tonight. I want to do one last thing uh, before we conclude. And Rabbi Cohen will be here to um, share and to, auth to autograph his book uh, that is available. I want us all to just stand for one moment. So I want us to do something. Let's stand in our places. The goal of ascending to a higher place is by instilling in others memories that we connect to. And many of us in the room knew Steve Drazen. Each of us have, for those of us that did know him and continue to know him, have a plethora of experiences, conversations, dinners, lunches, breakfasts, vacations, intimate moments, family opportunities. And so what I want us to do is, for those of us that have those experiences, I want us to just on this as Rabbi Cohen mentioned, Tu Bishvat, this day of rebirth, this day of planting, to plant within your head right now, to close your eyes and think about a memory, think about a moment in time that you had with Steve. What were the feelings? What were the emotions? Where were you? Maybe in your home or his home. Maybe you were on a walk, maybe the golf course, maybe a restaurant, wherever it might be. Just take that moment to think about the conversation and the company, the emotions, the feelings. Take that moment to think about the gift that you had with Steve in that moment of blessing. Take a minute or two to Picture that. And as you hold on to that story, this shouldn't be the last time that you think about those moments. Certainly it's been a year, but for the rest of our lives, certainly with Steve, but others who are no longer with us, continue to tell their stories. As Rabbi Cohen's book talks about living and leaving behind a legacy. And then, as Tubishvat reminds us, our trees will blossom our fruits will flourish, and the generations that come afterwards will bear the beauty of the nutrition that we have left for others to appreciate. I want to finish with a memorial prayer, the Kaddish in memory of Steve Drazen, for one final time this year. Yit gadal v'yit gadash shemei rabah, be'alma divra kirute v'yamlich malchute, be'chayechon uv'yomechon, Uvchaye de Cholbeit Yisrael. Ba'agala uvizman kariv imru amen. Yehe shme raba mevarach le'alam lalme al maya. Yit barach v'yishtabach v'yit ba'ar v'yit romam v'yit nase. V'yit adar v'yit ale v'yit halal shme de kutsha b'richu. Le'ela min kol b'irchata v'shirata. Tushbechata v'nechemata ta'amiran be'alma v'imru. Amen. Yehe shlama raba min shamaya v'chayim aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael v'imru. Amen. Ose shalom b'imramav hu ya'ase shalom aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael 
Vimru. Amen. May the God makes peace in the heavens above bring a source and a presence of peace to Steve Drazen's soul. May his memory be for a blessing, and may we continue to make the world a brighter one in memory of him, but also with honor and with glory for others for the rest of our lives. Amen. Thank you all for being here tonight. Rabbi Cohen is here for a few minutes, so if you'd like to purchase the book, or if you have the book and you would like him to sign the book, I know that he'll be available for a few moments. Thank you all for being here. Yeah, I love Ezra stories. Okay.